Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Friday. I have to say I'm extremely excited that today is Friday. I, I needed it to be Friday on one hand. There are maybe two or three things that I need to get done that make me wish it was really I have this kind of conflict inside of me. I want to be extremely excited that it's Friday. Um, and then I'm I'm just like, no, I need one more day so that I can just take the weekend without thinking about certain things. But instead, I'm going to have to think about those things either later, which I don't think is going to happen, or tomorrow morning, which is fine. I mean, that's not a problem. So it's all good. In general, it's a good Friday. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good Friday. It's a good Friday. It's a relaxing-ish Friday. That's the best way to put it. So I'm really going to have to figure out this whole camera thing. My hair looks a bit of a mess. You could tell I was, I had, anyway, I'm not even going to explain to you. So last week was a week. No, that's not true. The last seven days, I can't even say last week. The last few days had been a little bit of a wrinkle when it came to the live commentary, but I hopefully we got it all figured out today. I really wanted to go live on Tuesday to do this stream, and I'm realizing that I can't do that when it's a Zoom. I have to wait for the recording, and they haven't really sent the recording yet, so I will schedule it when I get the recording, and we will be able to kind of do that thing that I wanted to do. I'm, I'm, I'm still getting the in and outs of other kinds of live streaming here in the Naturally Conscious community, um, but I'm going to get it all figured out and it's going to work great. Today, I have queued up with the things that I had queued up last week, because if you remember last week, dear old me forgot that I hadn't finished the paper we had started the week before that. Ah, ah the trials and tribulations of being a creator and an online person. It's, there's just so many things to do. So I'm excited though. I have everything queued up. I hope correctly for us to continue on our educational slants because that's where we were last week and we're going to continue on with that. And then we're going to move into other directions. So hopefully you had a good week and you're excited about this and you're ready to dive in. I did. And, and, and I got, I got a check today. Now, for those of you in the US, a check is easy to say, oh yeah, you got a check today. In Europe, a check doesn't count. It doesn't exist. I mean, France is the only other country that really uses checks the way the US used to use, you know, uses checks or used to use. I don't know. US people do do you, Americans still use checks as much as they used to? Um, they got a check for a whopping $15. I think that it was cost more for them to print the paper. The paper, print the paper, put it in an envelope and send it to me. But this is what our U.S. government does because this was my $15 for jury duty service. If you remember a few weeks back, I was in the U.S. for jury duty service and I got paid $15. I still can't believe that they give people 50, 200 people in that room got $15 checks. I, I just, I find, I find it amazing. I find it hysterical. I was like, ooh, a check for $15. So anyway, I feel rich today. I'm going to go splurge. I'm going to spend those $15 on a pizza because I'm in Italy and, you know, pizza is good. And I'm going to have a nice pizza with my friends tonight. But before that, we are going to talk about overcoming plant blindness in science, education, and society. So, um... This is an opinion piece. I have not read this opinion piece at all. I'm excited to read it. I noticed that one of the names on this um, is somebody who over time, I've seen the name come up in future papers. So um, this is a, a paper that came out in Plants, People, Planet, PPP, PPP Journal. Let me share my, my screen so that you can start to see it too. Um, where is it? It's not very long. That's why I have a second one ready to go in case. And the second one is going to require us to get into a bit of a conversation piece. So here we are. This is an opinion piece in um, the open access journal, Plants, People, and Planet. For those of you that are wondering, this weird flash on my screen. Okay. And this is by Sarah B. Jose, uh, Chi Hang Wu, and Sophie N. Kamur. So these are um, three these are three people that come from the Global Plant Council from Hamilton, Ontario, and from the Saintsbury Laboratory and the University of East 
Anglia in Norwich Research Park in the UK. Um, so Canada, UK connection. And um, this is going to be a topic that's probably going to start coming up a little bit more frequently, the idea of education in general, education science. By this point, again, remember, we've been going a little bit chronologically. I believe we're in like 2000, let me see if it gets me here, 2019 by this point. So here we are in the world of 2019. And so by the 2019, right before the pandemic, we do have, start to see a major shift in the amount of papers that start to come out, opinion pieces, articles, research, long form essays, um, even the discussions on the whole concept of plant, plant blindness. Plant blindness goes from being a somewhat academic conversation. There's even the conversation, which I don't think I've done and I don't think I'm actually going to do about switching the name, which has been to a certain extent changed from an academic perspective to plant disparity disorder, uh, PDD. The reason for this change is because plant blindness implies that there's something wrong with being blind and where, um, so plant disparity disorder, I think it's disorder or yeah, I think it's disorder, is the idea that we just have this disparity in the way that we see plants. So it's not the blindness as in blindness is bad. I get the perspective. I don't think that from, I think from an academic perspective, it's it's a, it's a totally valid argument. I think it's not a very valid argument when you're talking about the general public. I don't mean that blindness is necessarily a good term, but plant disparity disorder does not say anything. And so I think that there's kind of a whole other way of naming it. That, that being said, this happens all over the place. Right now, um, if you're following along in the news, you'll see that the geological, I can't remember exactly the term of the society that votes, has decided to vote that Anthropocene is not the official um, era in which we're in uh, or scene in which we're in. I don't remember the exact terms, but uh, notwithstanding the fact that the general public will continue to call the period that we're in the Anthropocene, we are still technically in the Holocene. And so the reason for this is because it is not clear exactly when the beginning of the Anthropocene is. I think there's a general understanding and agreement that there is a, a, an influence of humans in a certain regard. But the when exactly that happened and when did it start to become something so detrimental that it warrants being called the Anthropocene is still very much under debate, which I have to say, as I read through um, the, the one of the reports about this, I was thinking, I was like, oh, you know, this seems a little bit like contrived just because of the date, blah, blah, blah. And then I read a very, very long piece about fire ants and about three particular sort of species of, fly, fly, um, of fire ants. And this fact that they create the, their unicolonial, unicolonial is a word I learned uh, today. And it, it basically was talking about the fact that ants in general um, have colonized the world way beyond. And I use the word colonize in this case very specifically because way more than the way that humans have. There's, um, I think, 200,000 times more ants on this planet than there are stars in the sky, to give you an idea of the sort of critical mass of ants, which I found fascinating. I had no idea about this. And they were the article was very thorough talking about, in particular, these three different species of ants because... Um, ants tend to create, you know, they have their colonies and in their colonies can be in multiple, like in a geographical area and they're sort of like little fiefdoms, you know, they do their thing, but they don't inter interact with each other that much. And yeah, they go to war and it was all these different metaphors around how the ants kind of keep themselves in check. These unicolonial instead, um, they basically, when a, a new queen is born, even though the original queen is still laying eggs, they they take one of the, these new baby queens and they they set her off to create a new um, colony. And the problem is that this colony is is the same colony as them. So because they're very scent based, these colonies don't go to war with one another. So they're separate, but they're united. And this means that they start to conquer more and more land. And then they um, stow away on ships. And so they've traveled around the world. And it was really interesting because they were talking how um, 
fire ants in particular, I found it fascinating because for me, the reason I started reading this article, besides the fact that I think that ants as super organisms are really interesting to follow and to think about because they have many characteristics of resilience and of growth and of taking over spaces and all these types of things. But also I was reading about it because when I was filming the documentary uh, down in South Florida, um, the one I shared the photos of and stuff to the PBS documentary, the day before they were filming with me, the directors um, and producers boss had been basically stood on a mound of fire ants in the middle of the night that she didn't notice it. And she was so badly bitten that she ended up in the hospital. And she was fine, luckily, overall, but, you know, she got dizzy and swoozy and she had all these different things. And so she ended up having to go to the hospital. So, uh, you know, fire ants are not something you play with. I grew, I grew up in South Florida. There are a lot of fire ants. And when you saw a fire mound, you, you kind of knew, like, there, there was respect there. You still sort of, as kids especially, really treated them very badly treated kin badly, but there was still respect because you knew that they could, they could fight back type of thing. So fire ants are fascinating to watch, but I hadn't realized that they were taking over so many different parts of the world. And so having that direct experience and then reading this extremely long and very detailed essay article about fire ants and so many different aspects of like, we think of ourselves as human beings as the only kind of species that creates and takes over space and and is invasive where um there are multiple species of ants that are on the like invasive species list and um and that cause some very serious damage so um so there's um the perspective that the idea that that we are not the only ones that behave in this way. And then that helps us understand kind of our animal nature, but then are we adding the metaphors of like wars and all these other battle type things because that's the way we as humans think of them. Are they really aggressive in a way that we are? Like, it's just a very fascinating, interesting conversation about it. Um, so go find out about fire ants if you're curious about another super organism that is taking over the world. and invading in a way not just plants because you know we have our invasive plants but these are invasive animals all right uh michelle says anthropocene yes the anthropocene um we'll get into it in another conversation i'll, I'll put links into the latest article about the the vote and what happened and why we're not in the anthropocene but we're still in the holocene and such um so something to see it. Okay, so I should have taken anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's talk about plant blindness. Oh. All right, so this is the societal impact statement. I, I wanted to go through this because we started to go through this already in relation to education. And so I want to continue on with that throat. And to, sorry, Michelle just clarified that she was saying that instead of the Anthropocene, excuse me, I misunderstood what she wrote. Now we might be coming into the ant. Tropocene, ant tropocene. That was a good one. That was a good one. I give you that one, Michelle. I give you that one. All right. Plants are amazing organi organisms. I already love this. This is a great, that's it. We could have just stopped right there. The, this is the opinion piece. This is their opinion. And I am in agreement with their opinion. They make up around 60% of all biomass, 60, excuse me. They make up around 80% of all biomass on earth play important roles in almost all ecosystems and support humans and other animals by providing shelter, oxygen, and food. Despite this, many people have a tendency to overlook plants, a phenomenon known as plant blindness. Uh, here, we explore the reasons behind plant blindness, discuss why some people are relatively unaffected by it, and promote education around plant science to overcome this phenomenon and raise awareness of the importance of plants in the wider community. Here's gonna be the interesting conversation piece, in my opinion. My conversation piece is going to be why do they want to promote um, the plant reawakening for people? So the, the ability for people to really see plants. Is this going to be a purely sustainable perspective? Is this going to be a perspective of plants are useful and therefore we should recognize them for being useful? Or is this going to be, especially because this is a paper in plant science, or is this going to be more of a paper be about plants as 
not persons per se, because I doubted that they would get so far as to actually use the word as plants and person and personhood in that conversation, but at least plants for plants sake. And this is um, a really interesting conversation that we keep having over and over again, which is we had a very deep conversations about this in the interspecies, uh, in the interspecies sprouts gathering, our, our kind of monthly networking event that we do every third Wednesday of the month in the naturally conscious community. We had a really great conversation about these types of topics, about how we probably have to move towards seeing plants from their sustainability perspective and living in harmony and connecting with plants from a more of recognizing quote unquote the value of what plants do for human beings first before we can ever get to the other side which is plants as persons plants as true rights plants as beings that have their own intelligence and their own ability to choose and their own um agency and authority in their own lives and i think we're going to have to go through these stages so first stage is if you don't see the plant at all, you almost, it's almost going to be impossible, if not really difficult to recognize the plant as, you know, a person. So we got to go through these intermediary stages. And the question then becomes, what are the intermediary stages? Like what makes sense and how do we stay there? How do we move from sustainability through regeneration? And how does that take us though to true recognition of plants for who they are? And we don't leave out steps in between because, or, or let me say it a different way, it, are those the right steps for us to be taken? Or should we, because I think if we keep talking about consciousness in certain, in certain conditions, we're just not going to get there. I do think that there are ways that we bypass a lot of this other stuff, especially if you go down the route of like, um, love and and different different avenues especially through the creative arts and through kind of more alternative ways of thinking i think you get there much faster but for the majority of people that they're just not going to get there so but that's that's going to be an interesting conversation piece to see to see where we're going to go with it here we explore the reasons behind plant blindness discuss why some people are relatively unaffected by it and promote education around plant science to overcome this phenomenon and raise awareness of the importance of plants in the wider community summary many people tend to overlook the importance of plants in the biosphere this phenomenon hold on a second i want to i want to make this a little easier to read for me um uh let's see this phenomenon is described as plant blindness, a term proposed 20 years ago to denote the inability of a person to notice plants and or appreciate their significance. To explore why some people seem immune to plant blindness, we asked plant scientists on Twitter why they became interested in plants. I think we need to go a little bit farther. And um, before we denote that they're immune, to plant blindness. I think they see plants, but I think we have different levels and I think it would be nice to better understand um, because if we think that scientists who think it's oak, I'm gonna use a different example for a second that hit me today. I was reading another article about how the, um, I think, I can't remember what country, I wanna say China, but do not, no, Japan, it was Japan, it was Japan. Japan just completed a, transplant of a pig's i want to say it was a liver pig's liver into a human the human was technically i believe declared brain dead and with the family's consent um was used to host this liver and to see you know as we're moving towards the idea that humans might be able to take uh, certain organisms certain organisms sort organs from other beings from like pigs and such my question was, if we were trying to do a transplant from human to human, we would have to go through all these hoops. In other words, the family had to be asked in order for the pig's liver to be um, transplanted into the human. My question is, did, did anybody ask the pig? Now, I am carnivorous. I'm omnivorous, really. So I am not saying that I have all the answers and that and, and I eat plants too. So this is a much wider discussion that I'm not sure I'm ready to get into right now, but I'm just going to throw it out here that these are the discussions we need to start having a little bit more. So when we talk about asking plant scientists why they became interested in plants, dissecting, cutting up, 
uh, rendering Franken plants and all these things is a form of interest of plants. It is, it is, it is. But we got a ways to go. We got a ways to go. And I, and, and yeah, we got a ways to go. We have lots of discussions to have about where we're going and how we want to get there. And what does that even look like when we're there? But let me just say that asking Twitter, you know, plant scientists, why they got interested in plants, I would like to understand what their interest in plants means personally. That's, that's what, because if we're going to build an educational system, we should build an educational system not that creates more scientists that are going to dissect our plants, but who are going to create more people who are conscious of plants as plant beings. That's that's what I would like. That, that's my own personal desire. personal desire. Many replied that their interest developed from early experiences in life or inspiring teachers at school. Others were attracted to the scientific disciplines related to plant science or valued the contrib contribution of plants to the global ecosystem and human civilization. That's a beautiful one. I like that. I like that last one. Based on these anecdotes and the empirical findings of other researchers, we argue that plants should play a more central role in biological education. I'm agreeing with this in all forms of education, really. From the early years to university and beyond, furthermore, as plant scientists, and as plant enthusiasts and advocates, we should do our best to raise awareness about the fascinating aspects of plants and their importance in human affairs within the wider community. I'm agreeing with all of this so far. Introduction. People tend to overlook plants as living organisms, usually viewing them as unassuming backdrops. So true, so sadly true. This phenomenon, known as plant blindness, also extends to scientists who often fail to recognize the importance of plants in the biosphere and in human affairs. Even within the biology community, we have encountered colleagues in biomedical fields with surprising limited knowledge of plant biology. Didn't we do that test where we had people in NCC, we had different sprouts ask um, the children in their lives, uh, like you know, nieces and nephews and grandchildren, and, and for some people children, what what kind of, what do they know about plants? And we discovered that even five, seven, eight-year-olds knew surprisingly little to nothing. Except, except for Michelle's like grandchildren who know everything because, you know, part of the education of, you know, Michelle's ecosystem at home and everything she has taught her grandchildren. Bow down, bow down deep. Uh, from the final year, from the from final year undergraduate students who did not realize that plants have DNA. I'm sorry, if you're an undergraduate student who does not know that plants have DNA, I think they should withhold your diploma. <sighs> to researchers who were surprised by the complexity of plants or the fact that their DNA is way more complex than ours as humans. For example, that they have an immune system. Okay, I'm going to stop. In one anecdote, a senior biomedical college reviewing, colleague, not college, colleague review, viewing a video of mimosa leaf closing exclaimed, it's alive. Oh. Some colleagues even seem surprised that plants matter enough to warrant extensive research. Okay, hold on. This is just tea, but let's just pretend it's something stronger. Matter enough to warrant extensive research and investment in the first place. What was it that we said last week? You got to go, you got to, you've got to recognize the bad stuff in order to be able to fix it. Like this is where we are. Despite the huge economic and societal impact of crop losses and plant diseases around the world. And maybe just the fact that plants are amazing. Like you started it. <laughs> Plants tend to be underrepresented in biology curricula despite being indispensable to all other life on Earth and are hugely prevalent in the biosphere. Plants comprise up to 450 gigatons of carbon. A total of, or of the total 550 gigatons of carbon of all the Earth's biomass versus just two gigaton for animals. Most of which is marine life. Surveys have demonstrated that students prefer to learn about animals and find them easier to recall than plants. Yes, 
we did do a really interesting paper on that on the the actual disparity the disparity we have in our visual in our way of visualizing that we um not only do we oftentimes not see plants at all but we also see them slower than not that they are slower but that our ability to recognize that they're there is slower than our ability to recognize other kinds of animals um Surveys have demonstrated that students prefer to learn about animals and find them easier to recall than plants. This is reflected in the number of undergraduate degrees with a focus on plant science in comparison with those specializing in zoology. For example, in the UK, a search of the universities and colleges admission service revealed nine botany or plant science focused bachelor degrees, while 53 institutions provided zoology and animal biology specific undergraduate degrees. Here, we discuss what plant blindness is and suggest some actions by which we might overcome it. I'm sure we have some ideas on this too. So let's, let's get into this. What is plant blindness? Plant blindness was described by Wondersee and Schussler in 1999. Actually, it was before 1999, I thought. But anyway, as the inability to notice plants in one's environment, recognize their importance, or appreciate their unique biological features. One of the major symptoms of plant blindness is a tendency to overlook plants, either because of a lack of knowledge about these organisms, their visual homogeneity, their generally non-threatening nature, or the lack of visual cues, such as movement or rapid changes. Another symptom of plant blindness is the failure to distinguish between the differing biology of plants and animals. The perceived outwardly slow lifestyles and behaviors of most plants means they do not allow they do not always captivate our attention in the same way that animals do, leading some to consider plants to be boring. Do we consider plants boring? No. I, I have a, there's a, there's a plant here. It's probably, Kia has been the first plant. Kia was the first plant that moved in with me here. Actually, I think he was here before I got here. And I, Key is a, a, a species of Dracenia. Can't see key because key's off camera right now and I'm not going to go reach. But I could stare for hours at key. I could just, I mean, really, I'm like that. Gary, the silver fur is outside. I can spend hours just staring at Gary. And Gary, Gary, at least some people would say, well, Gary moves a little because Gary is a silver fur, huge, so lots of wind. But Dracenia doesn't. And I still stare for hours at Dracenia. Anyway, I don't, I, I don't. Ironically, Sanders pointed out that humans lack the ability to perceive some of the most rapid known plant movements with the naked eye, such as the trapping movements of the carnivorous uh, Utricularia genus, raising the question of how to highlight these more exciting plant behaviors for the general public. It is often thought that our intrinsic human nature causes us to overlook the importance of plants. Why is that? Our brains filter out optical signals from the eyes based on our goals, experiences, and the potential biological relevance, mating opportunities or threats. Do we really still think that that's every, like, I understand that we as humans are animals and that our animals are intended to be instinctual, but is this really, are we still at the place where everything is just based on mating or threats? Like everything, really? Is that really what motivates everything? Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe. Of what we observe, meaning that we visually process far less of any given scene than we might expect. I just think that's conditioning. In a study of human attention, Newell noted that we are evolutionarily programmed to focus on and respond to animals because as predators or prey, they tend to be critical for human survival and their evasion or capture would require quick reaction. I don't know. I sometimes wonder whether we just got this whole thing all wrong. I mean, maybe I'm just we keep pigeonhole ourselves and saying that like over and over again, this is what it is. And this, this is why we're like that. I don't know. I think at first it helped us understand. It helps us think that we understand ourselves better because of that. But now I'm starting to wonder whether we just use that as an excuse. I don't know. It's just, just a thought, just a thought. Um, indeed, Ballas and Momsen reported, oh, 
reported that participants showed rapid image sequence were much better at accurately identifying those containing animals and plants. We already know this. We've actually reviewed a paper specifically on this topic. It's in the list. If you go back through the old ones, it, it's somewhere around visual disparity or something like that. I'll find the title. I'll put it in the related items in this. Um, Although intimate relationships with plants have developed in some human cultures, I gotta go up. Most people may have the tendency to detect and rapidly react to animals, and as a consequence, filter out the green background of our environment. So, what do you see in this photo? What do you see? What do you see? Plants are often ignored in favor of animals. Do you see a rooster or diverse plants dominated equi ecosystem? I see both. both. I see lots of different plants. I see that there's trees in the background. I see shrubs. I don't see grasses, which is good. I see lots of wild plants. I see some flowers and I see a cock in the middle. Why are some people interested in plants? What differentiates plant science, scientists and other plant enthusiasts from those who ignore plants? What distinguishes you, sprout plant enthusiast, from those who ignore plants? Think about it. Think about it and let me know what your thoughts are. I want to know. Put it in a comment. We asked the plant scientists of Twitter why they chose to study the intricacies of plant biology. Many of the respondents reported that their interest in plants developed from early experiences, including growing up on a farm, taking nature walks, or learning from inspirational teachers and lecturers. None of that was my case. None of it. Mine was all about music. Music. Others were attracted to other scientific disciplines, such as genetics or evolution, and realized they could explore interesting new questions in, those field, in these fields using plants. Some also mentioned the benefits of studying plants over other research organisms including their rapid life cycles, capacity to be cultured. I told you, I told you, it's because they can kill them more easily. And grown on a large scale and ease of genetic analysis, while the many open questions and opportunities for discovery in plant biology drew others to the field. One respondent stated her sudden realization that plants were living on such a different time scale to many other organisms prompted her fascination with plants. Obviously, it had to have been a woman who said that. I mean, no, I was just kidding with that. No, I, see, that makes sense. I, of course, as you probably have already heard me say a million times before, fell in love with plants because they're amazing musicians. And when kin make music, I can't help but listen. And when I listen to, to music made by plants, I can hear plants think. And all of a sudden, the whole world opened up. Then, woof, the floodgates opened. Amazing. Amazing. So everybody has their different experiences. Even if the intricacies of plant biology were not of direct interest, several plant scientists said they, choose their, they chose their field because of important benefits that plants provide to humankind. For organisms have... Few organisms have such direct impact on food and ecological security, climate and environmental sustainability, water and nutrient cycles, medicine, and general natural beauty. One respondent eloquently stated that plants produce the seeds of our collective future. Understanding these benefits provides immunity against one of some of the other symptoms of plant blindness listed by Wandershe and Sussler, especially the failure to realize the importance of plants for human existence. Let's read some of these comments. These are what the respondents on Twitter write. One wrote, the trees are easier to catch. They don't move or bite you usually while you measure them. I don't think that's a good reason, Patrick, and I would not be proud of that answer personally. That's like saying that you chose your significant other because they didn't run away from you when you went to talk to them. Not a good, not a good reason. Not a good reason. Lizzie Parker says, one, food security, environmental sustainability. Two, enjoying gardening. Three, inspired by botanical art. I like that one. Four, plants have really cool interactions with loads of other organisms, especially mycorrhizal. Five, I had inspiring teachers, lecturers who are enthusiastic about plants. Lizzie, great answer. Great, great answer. I actually like that. Let's see what Daniela says. 
Because when you notice that all the green surrounding you is alive and breathing, just living with completely different and slower time frame, it blowed, blowed my mind. It blowed, blew, blew my mind, blew my mind. It felt like living around aliens and noticing it just then. And who wouldn't want to work with aliens? Bingo! Daniela. Daniela is the winner. Ding, 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 ding. I like that answer. Alexandra says, to be really, to be really mm, corny about it, like me and my corny love story. It's so corny, but it's so true. Plants help me understand what true love means. Seriously, amazing. Because food, plants, and our relationship to them are fascinating and beautiful reflections of human culture and history. And they produce the seeds of our collective future. And also, I like to eat them. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough, Alexandra. Jenna says, because plants are transformational. I am loving these answers. Look, seriously, Patrick, you need to go read these other answers. Seriously. We can't humanize them. Their time scales, requirements, and ways of perceiving their environment are so different to ours. It's humbling them. We rely for our very air on a kingdom we barely understand. Oh, I'm not supposed to clap. I heard that that hurts your ears if you're listening on if you're listening on headphones. So you go, Janice. I, I like you already. Carol says, without plants, there would be no animals. Plants blindness is a curable disease. Aho. Nicola says, for me, it started with spotting wildflowers on country walks and wanting to know wh what they were, then moving from picture guides to keys, and so learning more plant anatomy, then realizing I could combine my love of plants and wildlife with the science I enjoyed at school. It's pretty good. Amy says, I always loved plants, but focused on animal behavior evolution because the questions were so interesting to me. Just took one plant ecology course to make me realize I could ask all the same cool questions with plants and I never looked back. Sam says, I like plants because they are co as complex as animals. More complex at times. They have to face the same problems, but do so without being able to move. Most of the mechanisms they use to do this are hidden under the hood. Instead of behavior, they have adapted, de uh, they have adapted development and metabolism. That's cool. <laughs> and Kaiser says, I chose plant sci over other bio because one, phenotypic plasticity was so amazing to me as a concept. I am with you on that, Kaiser. And plant side lectures were the best of the bio lectures. I wanted to feed the world and for, I think, from the side of blood. Well, that's true. I guess you don't faint from the side of sap. <laughs> so, which is not really blood, okay? I understand that. It was just an off the cuff comment. Four, how can we overcome plant blindness? Early educational experience providing equal exposure to plants, microbes, and animals are crucial for counteracting plant blindness and encouraging future generations of plant scientists. 20 years ago, Wondersee and Schussler concluded that plants have historically rewarded our, our focused study, observation, and investigation, and emphasized the need to maintain the identity and visibility of botany. Two years later, they hypothesized that early well-planned education and interaction with plants is key to overcoming what they described as default human condition of plant blindness. Is it default human condition or is it default human conditioning? I still think it's pretty scary for human beings to really admit to themselves. Kind of like one of the comments that said, you know, we, we rely on for the very air we breathe, something we understand so little. I think it's a little bit like that. I think it's very difficult for humans to truly understand. I think by, by having plant blindness, you sort of assume that they're there for you that can just exist for our benefit. And therefore, I don't have to admit to myself that my entire existence is relying on another being that may or may not at one point choose to reverse their breathing and completely destroy, like change the ecosystem in which I live, which I may not be able to survive from. Why? Because I am dependent on kin rather than having developed any other kind of like true awareness around it. That, that's, that's just me. Ah, we can attest 
had that to this having had the benefit of excellent teachers and mentors whose enthusiasm instilled in us a love of plants at an early age several of the respondents on twitter also described how passionate lectures converted them from other biological disciplines on plant science to plant science highlighting the importance of high quality plant science teaching throughout biological education i hear this a lot too there's a podcast that i listen to that i love it's called in defense of plants this is uh, their sticker this is their logo in defense of plants and um because i'm a patreon so i got a sticker and um and many of their uh, many of matt's guests on the show are people who started off their career in other areas and then switched over to the plant sciences because of one really amazing lecture or one really interesting class and stuff like that so um where was i Oh, highlighting uh, plant sciences throughout biological education. To prevent plant blindness in students and encourage them to consider a career in plant science, Schussler and Olzak proposed that biology teachers should present equal numbers of plants and animal examples to increase student familiarity with and interest in plants. Drea encouraged lecturers to use food security and biodiversity threats to emphasize the importance of plants to our own survival, raising students' awareness of the vital services performed by plants. Recently, Krosnick, Baker, and Moore successfully decreased plant blindness in a group of students by inviting them to grow a plant from seed and monitor its development. While also, isn't this what we all did as kids? How many of you did the famous bean uh, activity? You remember the bean activity? The bean activity where you took like a little tin of like Vienna sausages or something like that. I don't. This is a U.S. centric thing, by the way, but little tin and then you wrapped it in paper and then you glued uh beans to them and then you took one be you filled with dirt and you put one bean in it and you watch the bean grow didn't didn't we all do that i remember that i totally remember that i don't know if i love the fact that we like glued the beans to the outside but you know the bean on the inside was the important part i totally remember bringing a pack of black beans because of course i'm cuban black beans to school in order to put the bean. I mean, colored beans would have been nicer, but I, or maybe I did red beans. One of the two. Okay. <laughs> oh, we did sunflowers. There we go. See, others did it too, but you know, we grew plants. Um, we're, uh, we're, while also relating concepts delivered in lectures to these pet plants. I like that they're pet plants. I have pet I don't know. I think my the plants that live with me are definitely not pets. They they're more in control of the household than I am. The authors reported that students had an increased appreciation and attention for plants, with almost planning to grow more plants, with most planning to grow more plants in the future. In addition to promoting plant science as a career, we should aim to counteract plant blindness in the wider community by raising awareness about the importance of plants in human affairs. This condition is detrimental to society, as plant biodiversity is in rapid but near silent declination, de decline that threatens the stability of all the Earth's ecosystems. It's true. Increasing the public appreciation of plants may impact the funding allocated to their conservation, while also highlighting the practical and cultural importance of plants to people who might otherwise never consider it. Our innate animal-based visual attention can be at least partially balanced by focusing one's attention on plants and their intricacies. Wandersee and Schussler, and Schussler, Schussler, reported that early hands-on experiences with of growing plants alongside a knowledgeable adult mentor is a good predictor of interest in and scientific understanding of plants later in life. I have to say, as a person who never had like a real garden, I mean, we had a garden in my house, but it was mainly for the turtles that, <laughs> that were growing in there. And I wish like now when I have a friend of mine who works in a school that has like a, a school garden and the kids get to play in the school garden and help with the growing of the food and help with the growing of the plants in general. And I am jealous in a good way. So excited that they have this program because I wish, I think I would be much less fearful of plants in general. And I, I, I love, you obviously know I love plants, but I am also extremely cautious and somewhat fearful of plants. Like I'm not one that picks something up without knowing I have to be taught. Um, if I'm not taught, then I I don't I don't pluck or taste or anything like that randomly in it because I grew up 
without any of that kind of knowledge. So I've had to learn, you know, foraging skills and, and wilderness skills and all kinds of different skills, even with houseplants. I am still not, I try to listen. I tend to be an overprotective mother hen. Like I'm a, you think I'm an overprotective mama sprout on, in NCC. I am an overprotective mama sprout all over the freaking place. And so therefore I can like overwater at times. I get really worried. I get nervous. I would be a terrible mother. Like, um, yeah. Whether on Twitter, YouTube, blog posts, or magazine articles, TV or radio, face to face or in lecture halls, we should all share our love of plants as widely as possible. Yes, go on and share your love of plants. Focusing people's attention on fascinating nature of these under underappreciated organisms, hence invite them all to come to the naturally conscious community. We challenge you to do one thing today to spread this message and open someone's eyes to the wonders of plants and plant science. Well, that was a pretty cute and simple paper. I like it. I like it simple. I mean, I don't think that they really gave any, I mean, is there anything useful in here other than says share the love? But if you don't love plants, there's nothing in here that helps you understand that you have to, what you can do in education or society. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know about that. I don't know. All right. We still have time. So I actually queued up something else, but it, I think it's going to be more of a discussion piece before we ever get into the idea of reading. And let me explain why. Okay. This is one that I've had on my radar for a very long time. Um, wait. Yes. Okay. Let me share my screen. I don't know if you have other interesting ideas of, or if you know of programs that are sharing um, about, if you're sharing, like have other educational opportunities, please share them with others. Like we, we want to know about them. We want to know what's going on and such. Okay. I did queue up a second paper this time. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Okay. This is going to switch us into a different gear. It's one that I have had on my list for so long, especially because this came out. This is volume five. Why is this volume five? Hold on. Let me make sure. Yeah, this is really what we're looking at. Why look at plants? So this was part of a larger book piece called Critical Plant Studies, Philosophy, Literature, and Culture. Um, this is a series that was edited by Michael Martyr. Michael Martyr, you've heard us talk about so many times. Michael Martyr is awesome. He is a professor of philosophy in plant studies. He is um, at the University of Basque country in, um, in Spain. And this is actually a piece by Gio Giovanni Aloy. Now, Giovanni Aloy is another one that we talk about quite often in NCC in many different aspects because Aloy is um, a professor in art, more of like design and art, and but who has specialized in really, as he says it in this, the biological emergence in contemporary art. So he's written many very interesting um, pieces and this is actually a very long paper not a paper it's actually a book okay it's a book but we're not going to go through the whole book okay what i want to do is go through the introduction of why look at plants the reason is because i want to this is i'll share of course everything here i want to go through this book because um i want you to go off and read it on your own i mean there's some really great this is why I said this is going to be a little bit of a conversation at the very beginning. So as you can see, this is a book. It has the introduction that was. So this is a series. This is volume five in this series on critical plant studies. Remember, the critical plant studies is now becoming full fledged, um, a full fledged sort of area of research and study at the academic level. And this series has many different pieces to it. This series, this particular edition was, uh, I believe, uh, what's the word, curated by Aloy, and he wrote the introduction, which is really what I want to go through today, because we're not going to go through all 50 pages of the whole thing. It, it is divided into multiple sections. You have part one, which is the forest, and so you have some, um, some pieces by uh, Aloy himself and Caroline Picard, and there's Natasha Myers, who I love now. She has become my new love. 
I didn't even realize that she was in here. Um, she and I just had a conversation and I'm looking forward to having a much deeper conversation with her. She is the person that is on plant sensing that we recently reviewed one of her pages, one of her papers. So you can go back and you can read through it. And Natasha Myers, um, plant, uh, um, Plantropology is really kind of her direction, plant sensing. She's also a dancer. So uh, Jenny Kendler, and then there's the trees part. So again, some more writing. Some of these people I don't know, which I'm looking forward to getting to know. Then you have the garden part three, and then where Michael Martyr himself has a piece. And then part four is the greenhouse. So that talks about different part. Part five is the store. Hmm, interesting. And part six is the house. So this is all around why look at plants at all. We have the laboratory and then of other species. I think that's the end. So as you can see, it's a relatively long, actually it's, I, it's not 50 pages. It's like, yeah, it's 50 pages. It's 200 pages of a book and it's 50 pages here. So as you can tell, it's way too long. We're not gonna go through this because we would just basically spend months going through this. What I want to do is go through um, the about this book, the introduction type piece, and um, to encourage you to go off and read it. By the way, speaking of books, if you have not yet, please cast your vote for our next, uh, we are in the preliminary voting stage for our next book in the Plant Wisdom Book Club. This Friday, we will be having, not this Friday, Next, not this Friday, because that's today. Next Friday, we will be having the final discussion on the book that we're currently reading, which is Building the Future of Innovation on Millions of Years of Natural Intelligence by Lean Gorison. And we have started the process for voting for our next book so that by the time we do the final discussion, we can announce what the next book will be. So we do a preliminary count where we go through about 50 to 60 books and we whittle that down to the top five and then we vote next week for the from the top five. So if you're in the Plant Wisdom Book Club, now's the time for you to go and cast your vote if you haven't already done it. Um, as always, the selection is so interesting and good. We have such, I have to hold myself back from adding new books to the list because the our, our list is so deep already and it's hard to make choices from it. I mean, we read one book every, every two months. So that means, you know, we read six books in a year. It doesn't whittle the book the list down that much given how many books there are out there. Okay, so about this book, why look at plants? The question posed by the title of this book might seem redundant to some. Haven't we been looking at plants for millennia already? What's there to see that we haven't already? So much, so much. Aren't plants carefully identified, recorded, represented, and classified in many prestigious botanical works? Don't we look at plants every time we take a walk in the park, stroll in a forest, eat our greens, or tend to our flowers in the garden? Well, yes and no is the answer to all those questions. The title of this book adopts and reworks that of John Berger's seminal essay, Why Look at Animals? And it does so provocatively as well as politically. Berger's essay, essay identified and criticized fundamental aspects of our limited ability to look at animals through different media, spaces, theoretical context and historical milieus. A key to his main argument is the notion that photography and film have contributed to a counterproductive assimilation of animals within an objectifying bourgeois culture of consumption. If you think animals got it rough, buddy, buddy, buddy. In short, stripped of their mystical powers, animals, where am I? Animals have been reduced to economic tokens in reckless capitalist economies. Through this desacralizing process, their representative, representational function has been that of normative, normativizing and moralizing humans, serving as identity building blocks. For this reason, the visual centrality occupied by animals in specific photographic and filmic genres is in truth fictitious. Yes, we do look at animals in our everyday lives, but we only do so in the implicit hope of discovering a natural truth about ourselves. When that process fails, we rapidly lose interest as is the case of animals confined in zoos, which are dependent on keepers and are alienated from their natural environments. They languish as evidential tokens of their relatives in the wild, but nothing more. 
what is at play in our looking at animals, according to Berger, is therefore a form of animal blindness. All right, I I'm with you so far. I I'm with you on this. The impossibility to see animals beyond the reflections of ourselves, beyond the cultural norms that have been constructed for us by centuries of philosophical thinking and scientific practices that more or less directly have enabled the objectification and marginalization of animals in today's world. It is in this context that the book addresses the equivalent cultural phenomenon to animal blindness concerning the ultimate otherness of the vegetal world. Plant blindness essentially is our cultural inability to conceive plants beyond the prefixed in a, a cultural schemata, as we just learned in the previous paper, when, although we already knew it. I mean, there's nothing we learned in that paper yet, but it was a very good exercise. It is that which simultaneously reduces them to resources or aesthetic objects. From an aesthetic perspective, more specifically, paying attention to plants entails the possibility of considering new modes of attention and crafting new modalities of perception. Paying attention to plants entails the possibility of considering new modes of attention and crafting new modalities of perception. I like that sentence. That very much matches what we talk about. New modes of attention, new modes of being, of presence, and new crafting new modalities, expanding into new modalities of perception. Me like, I'm gonna remember that because we have I am plant coming up very soon in less than two weeks. And this is going to be perfect for I am plant. Both opportunities can bear substantial productivities in our relationship with the current challenges impacting our planet. At stake is the opportunity to understand plants as integral coexisting actants emphasis on the word actants, that play defining roles in the functioning of ecosystems on this planet. What we look at and how we look const constitute essential parameters in the recuperation of alternative gazes and the crafting of new ones, modalities of engagement that entail more than the ocular, modalities that can lead to re-ontologization -ontologi of the living. That's a big word. How many times have you seen that word or even written that word in your lifetime? Although this notion is neither new nor necessarily hard to assimilate in scientific discourses, the humanities have been severely lagging behind in their move towards a posthumous conception of plants. However, the reluctance to disavow an inherent anthropocentric framework that still pervades many disciplines is now being challenged by a new level of global urgency. The environmental threat we all face might just shift our focus at last. On August 29, 2016, the Working Group on the Anthropocene, which doesn't exist, but we might be heading towards an Anthropocene. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Chaired by Jan Zalesiewicz. Zal I don't, I'm so you, you, you probably got that. Okay. Sorry. Presented the recommendation to the International Geological Congress in Cape Town that the term Anthropocene should be used to define the current geological epoch. And unfortunately, as we talked about at the very beginning, that recommendation failed. It just failed recently. Far from being uncontroversial, the concept inscribes humanity's detrimental impact on Earth as the most defining upon climate and environments. Thereafter, on October 24th, it was announced that the world entered a new area of climate change reality defined by the crossing of 400, uh, oh God, 400 CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere, a level which will not dip for many generations. This news was followed by the starting revelation that Arctic I'm sorry, I just want to read, make sure that all he has in the footnotes are just citations. Okay, they are, they're just citations. Whew, okay. This news was followed by the startling revelation that Arctic and Antarctic sea ice reached record lows, melting much, much faster than scientists had anticipated. And in July, 2017, an iceberg twice the size of Luxembourg broke off the Antarctic Peninsula. Despite the denial that seems to pervade the current US administration, hey, why the U.S.? 
Signs that something is changing are undeniable. So while the label sixth extinction is widely being used to help us envision the gravity of the current changes in climate balance, not much is actually known about how plants upon which all biodiversity on the planet depend will be affected. Because nobody cares. That's not true. We care. We care. That's not true that nobody cares. But I gotta say the sliver is much smaller of the people who care. A 2015 study claims that the effects of climate change on plant growth will likely vary by region with Northern areas in places like Russia, China, and Canada gaining growing days. However, already hot tropical regions could lose as many as 200 growing days per year. In total, 3.4 billion people will live in countries that lose nearly a third of their growing days. More than 2 billion of those people live in low-income countries, according to the study. As I write this introduction, President Donald Trump <gasps> has officially announced that he will pull the United States of America from the Paris Climate Agreement, which in 2015 brought together 195 countries with the goal of preventing global temperatures from rising by two degrees Celsius by the end of the century. This move casts a dark shadow over the already critical, fragile economical balance of our planet. However, while it is easy to claim that individuals can do little in the face of catastrophe, cli catastrophic climate change, it is important to remember that the environmental alterations caused by multinationals, intensive agriculture and farming, deforestation and transportation are all dependent on individual choices that can be positively altered. And this is the crux of the conversation that we had in the I Sprouts. Sorry, I'm trying not to clap in the Ice Spots gathering, our networking gathering on Wednesday. This was the heart of it. This was it. This was it. Because every time we try to get into these discussions, every time everybody points to the multinational, the government, the this, the that, all of those exist to support us. Now, I am not saying that there are not corruptions in the chains. Of course there are, but those chains are still made of humans and the humans are us making choices. So going back to our previous paper, the one we were just reading, we need to be more vocal. We need to be more active. We need to ask more questions. We need to be more discerning in our choices and in our purchases. We need to even admit when we don't know things in order for us to have better, more honest and open conversations. We as individuals, as sprouts, at minimum, we need to be having these conversations, folks. We need to, we need to, we need to stop blaming them and push our agendas through and get up to them and touch them. But we need to start it. It has to be built from the bottom up. Since the beginning of this millennia, the field of human animal studies has achieved the heroic task of awakening the conscious of Western philosophy to the objectification of animals, which has led to their unethical cultural marginalization and abhorrent treatment. While human animal studies might not single-handedly prevent the sixth extinction or reverse climate change, thus far it has certainly outlined a productive arena for the discussion of human-animal relations in universities around the world. Its influence has already spilled into popular culture. It is therefore common today to encounter human animal studies student groups in many campuses and a greater visibility of related cases in the curriculum. For the first time, discussing animals outside the scientific and veterinarian remit is no longer a matter of curiosity. The hope is that with time, human animal study arguments will substantially impact on human perception of animals, making more and more of us aware of the challenges involving overcoming the limitations imposed by cultural blinkers, and thus enabling the emergence of new, more ethically considerate and substantial human animal relations, not growing pigs, simply for one little liver. Similar to these positive strides in animal studies, this book offers the opportunity to further the dialogue about plants that have been recently beginning to emerge. Recently, in the case of when this book was written back in 2019, now we are increasing that from recently, like we're, we're increasing that amount. The increased presence of plants in contemporary art is a relatively recent phenomenon that can be read in conjunction with the emergence of animals in the gallery space witnessed over the past 30 years. Plants in the gallery space can be interpreted as a symptom of the wrongness characterizing human-plant relationships, but also a wake-up call to reappraise this relationship at a time of crisis. 
The hope is that, like human animal studies, the field of plant studies will enrich our perspectives on plants, thus leading to different modalities in what right now constitutes a mostly unacknowledged critical node in the survival of life on the planet. This book focuses on representation and contemporary art to counterbalance the predominantly scientific attention that has been given to plants in the traditional disciplinary structure. It does so in the belief that representation, as implicitly argued by Berger, constitutes the most agentially charged world-forming tool at our disposal. The last century more than any previous, has been characterized by a heightened critical approach to representation. Just consider the essential contributions of race and gender studies, feminist theories, and the more recent emphasis on cultural decolonization. We therefore now stand at a unique point in the production of knowledge itself, a point in which we can identify the shortcomings of past representational, representational, representational strategies in order to devise new speculative approaches capable of decentering fictitious anthropocentric exceptionalisms that have led us where we are today. The mapping of new intraactive agential interconnectedness of human non-human biosystems is already central to many artistic and philosophical discourses. It is only bound to acquire more traction over the next few years. Central to the reconfiguration of anthropocentric paradigm in this book are posthumanist approaches, posthumanist approaches based on the work of Donna Haraway and Carrie Wolf. Notions of dark ecology conceived by Timothy Morton, Mark Fisher's paradigm of capitalist realism, Jason W. Moore's conceptions of capital, capital, capitalism, and most importantly, Foucault's theorizations of powers and biopolitics. Ooh, we've talked about Foucault's different in, in many of the different papers. Essentially, this is a multi-authored collaborative book, not quite an edited collection, but a gathering of multidisciplinary perspectives, voices, experiences, perceptions, and reflections on plant being. When I set off to write a book about plants in contemporary arts and culture, I realized that the subject calling for band the subject called for abandoning the monographic format. I focused on my personal and cultural relationships with plants and considered the wealth of my colleagues and friends' expert experiences to constitute a large part of my own interest in plants. Plant fixity, perceived passivity, and resilient silent silent presence have for over 2000 years relegated plants to cultural backgrounds. These reductionisms have been used to assess plants ontological inferiority towards animals and even more so humans. I therefore became interested in the opportunity of upturning this very contingency in a productive way, or at least taking it as a productive starting point around with to conceive plant beings from new perspectives. I love that there's like language here that's so similar to our language. Have you noticed that? I mean, I don't think I'd ever thought about plant fixity, but I get it, I get it. From this consideration, it followed that because of plant fixity and perceived plant passivity, our experiences are predominantly mediated by the spaces in which we interact with them, as well as by our cultural lenses that these spaces inscribe. Inspired by Berger's essay and its implicit reference to the act of looking at a fundamental tool of power, I thus returned to Foucault's notion of panop panopticon and biopower. But more specifically, I decided to focus on his interest in epistemetic specializations, the ability space, materials, architectural, and representational dimensions have to define power knowledge relationships. In other words, this book structure is devised upon the notion that the interaction between plants, humans, and animals are deeply defined on material grounds. That meaning is constructed through the spatial relationships shared by actants and by the cultural laws and power dynamics inscribed in such spatializations. I just wanna sit with that for a second because I find Aloy's words, I've, I've read several of his different pieces, and I have to say, although he does use the very academic writing that so many of these use, um, you know, really focusing on the word of epistemetic and, and ontologies, and it's completely understandable, right? That's the audience that this is poking. And this is the reason why I'm not reading this whole, I mean, besides the fact that, like I said, it's 
it's 48 pages here. It's a 1200 page book. Like if I was reading it like a book. Um, but I do love the fact that he, he, I don't know if he does it on purpose or if it's just, because he's Italian or what it is, I do feel like he tries to expand. Expand is not the right word either. He tries to engulf a more secular audience from the academic audience that he's working to. And I think, and he, he touches on, I mean, coming from the idea of contemporary art and particularly design and like spaces. It's not art as in like paintings only, but more of um, how the plants interact with the spaces they're in and specifically in internal spaces. Um, I do really love the idea that he is trying to show, uh, there was a series that was uh, a series of, of a painter painted about plants in spaces, like in indoor spaces and his ability to bring the plant forward as as if if i'm doing still life or if i'm if i'm if i'm doing a portrait of a human being i i even though the the human being is if i look at a portrait of a human being even though the human being is kind of two-dimensional and still i still have the sense of the aliveness of the being and his way of looking at contemporary of uh, uh, looking at art is is in some ways feels that same way like feels like you're looking at a plant not as an object of the room you know like a wall and a plant and a painting and whatever and you're when you're drawing out the scene of a space but it feels like he's drawing the plant as a portrait like not him drawing but the way he's describing it is is giving it a whole new connotation and i feel like that's really what he's trying to do he's trying to say that there is an interaction when we look at a, at a scene of some sort of contemporary art and we see animals and humans Berger's work was to try to pull out the animal and so that we don't look at the animal as an object but you know really bringing the animal into the forefront as another living being so you have a human and an animal and Aloise now pulling the plants in and saying no we actually have multiple beings we have a human we have a plant we have an animal all in sharing this space and creating this this shared um beingness this shared personhood between them and i think that he has this way of it's still an academic audience but i think that that's really where he's pulling to of, of moving us into this understanding that when i look at art and i see like i i was in um i remember this so distinctly i was in a museum once and i was looking at old tapestries you know from from uh, who knows some some Asian, you know, ancestry was really quite beautiful. And they were all plant motifs and that were being looked at. If they would have had faces of people, we would be treating them and thinking about them quite differently than the fact that they have plants. And it was like the there was a symbology of the fact that there was this plant, but it was relegated to this symbology, not to the plant themselves. And it was just very two dimensional, very very removed from the fact that the plant, if it would have been the portrait of a person representing their family crest or their, you know, their, their family lineage, the conversation would have been very different than this plant that's representing a lineage as well. And so I feel like sometimes reading through Eloise's work pulls out this element. And I find that really fascinating because I think it would very much change the way we interact with even our, I myself have learned and through this process. So I don't, I, ne I never was a person before my plant reawakening. I didn't like flower prints at all. Like I, I would have never picked, you know, a couch like this that has a flower print on it and, and I would have never experienced that. And I have found that now I'm very attracted to certain types of flower prints because like even my bed has a flower print, something that probably, you know, 20 years ago, I would have never had on my bed a flower print, but I'm very called to the flower print now because there's a, a relationship with the plant that is being depicted. So the types of poppies and wildflowers that are on my bed or in this, which are more depictions of, you know, these, these types of roses and other kinds of plants that are there. And 
there's more of a feeling of relationship um, that I would have with a living being rather than a print that is just there. And that has been something that has come very gradually. It wasn't something I did on purpose. I just realized one day that I was buying flower prints and I stopped to ask myself, why was I doing this when I knew very much? And, you know, I'm a child of the eighties where the flower prints were kind of like, no, absolute, at least for me, I was like, no, 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 no. So this really has been an interesting um, evolution of a relationship to uh, uh, the artistic or the, the visual space in a new way. That was my little rant. Sorry. It was just, it was just a realization as I've like now came into a better understanding of what I'm reading about him. The first two chapters titled Lost in the Post Sublime Forest and Trees Upside Down, Inside Out and Moving are an exception. They directly address sublimity and anthropomorphism as two of the primary epistemic modalities that limit our relationship with plants through outdated, culturally encoded epistemic dimensions. Neither worldly, neither wholly negative nor inherently positive, both sublimity and anthropomorphism most regularly still define objectifying and superficial modes of engagement that prevent us from moving in new epistemic directions. Following this ground priming pair, each chapter moves beyond classical epistemic limitations by focusing on a more or less delineated space in which plant-human interactions takes place. The garden, the greenhouse, the store, the house, and the laboratory have been identified as space situations that have recurred more frequently and productive, productively in contemporary art. Therefore, all co-authors co were asked to identify a particular plant being relationality defined by the space in which the plant lives and to use that as a starting point to articulate new perspectives. Oh, spider plant and I could have had a wonderful, like we could have written a really awesome piece for this, right? Totally could have, totally could have. Uh, blah, 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 sorry. As articulate new perspectives, approaches symbolism and considerations. The last chapter titled Of Other Spaces is concerned with the alternative and fluid spatializations of transitional spaces, places like lobbies, offices, laundromats, restaurants, or gallery spaces. I also very much cared for this book through I also very much care that this book should be accessible as possible, as accessible as possible while retaining academic integrity. See, this is what I was saying. Like you could feel that his trying to put it into words that are accessible while still remembering that this is going through an academic audience. And Tene, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture, which is he is the um, editor of, of which I have been the editor in chief, sorry, read ahead, read ahead, since 2006, has consistently promoted multidisciplinary and knowledge transfer among students, artists, scholars, curators, and general readers. They are quite an amazing journal. We uh, widening participation and reaching beyond the boundaries of the academic community has also played a vital role in everything I have published so far, including my first book, Art and Animals. Therefore, the contributions in this book have tried to avoid at all costs a purely philosophical treatment of plants in which living beings are reduced to tokens performing intellectual acrobatics designed to impress a scholarly elite. The field of human animal studies knows a thing or two about this counterproductive approach marked by an utter discontent, disconnect between the living and the ethical urgency that the living imposes upon those working, making, writing, thinking with it. Contemporary art has the ability to com complement, unhinge, problematize, and challenge philosophical concepts. The synergy between the two can constitute a powerful tool just as long as it is put to work to achieve actual change. Following these parameters has produced a thoroughly heterogeneous gathering of insights, stories, experiences, perspectives, and arguments encompassing multiple disciplines and methodologies. As much as it was possible, I wanted all co-authors to own and interpret their thinking space in format and content for the purpose of enabling as many plant-human becomings and co-evolutions to emerge. In every chapter, my own contribution outlines the emergence of a specific modality of plant being through a selection of contemporary art examples that challenges pre-established norms, approaches, and methodologies. The contributions of my colleagues aptly problematize, expand, and upturn my own perspectives in creative and original ways. 
Ultimately, I wanted this book to be a kaleidoscope in essence and to provide as many different thinking models dedicated to the structuring of new, innovative, and challenging ways to conceive plants. By no means did I hope for it to be a comprehensive and to chart a history of plants in contemporary art. This is a book I am not interested in writing, at least not yet. In this instance, I instead focused on specific examples which helped me to develop my knowledge and thinking and which I hope will instigate or further the interest of many readers. These are examples that test the boundaries of representation, epistemology, ontology, and ethics against the ultimate otherness of plant being. All right, I got a lot of reading to do, ladies and gentlemen. Glad I've got a lot of reading to do. So this is part of Critical Plant Studies, Philosophy, Literature, and Culture. This is volume five, as I mentioned, which is Why Look at Plants, the, Botan the Botanical Emergence in Contemporary Art, written and edited by Giovanni Aloy and all of his colleagues. And of course, I will include it in um, when I post about this, I'll include, uh, you know, the, the citation so that you can always go and look at it. Wow, that was pretty, those were pretty two kind of distinct, but I think they played into one another. Hopefully you saw my thread, you know, the, the, the what I was trying to do, like the identify, we're still going to talk a lot more about education at some point, we really need to. I think that what we read in relation to the beginning, the first paper is really just the, the beginning basics of the fact that there is this thing called plant blindness, we need to do something about it, we really need to think about it in different ways. This takes us into one form of education, which is the education in contemporary art. And how is it that this botanical emergence, this plantness and vegetality that is coming through the art, the artistic realms is really helping us to redefine and expand our own perceptions of plantness, of vegetality, and as well as our own perceptions of humanness. Because as the human, the animal, the plant converge as in their beingness, in their, in their personhood, I think we start to re recognize more similarities within each other, as well as the differences that we need to respect. So this is a great like overall book to go through. And I think it's going to be fantastic for those of you that want to dig it and read it. I think we're at a good stopping point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, next week, a reminder, we will not be here because the Plant Wisdom Book Club um, meets at the exact same time. Therefore, we're going to be having that discussion. If you are interested and you've never participated in one, you are welcome to drop in. It is part of Seedling Sprouts. You have uh, so you can come in and participate in the book. Even if you haven't read the book, it's always fascinating to listen. And we inevitably get off topic and get into really interesting conversations that the book triggers in us. So there's always ways to participate in some way or shape or form. Um, I'll be back then in two weeks to continue continue on with our giant list of papers that is always growing. I am so excited about the fact that we are now in 2019 in relation to my kind of chronological perspective. At some point, we'll get out of the chronology, you know, out of the looking at it by date, but it's just an easier organization because I find it I just find it because I don't want to read through them beforehand. I want to do this while we read it together and I analyze it really live with you. I don't, it would be hard for me to try to like gather them up into certain things. Um, I, I feel like this is the best way to do it. If you have other suggestions or other ideas, as always, write them in the comments because um, I, I'm always looking for ways to improve. I still keep dreaming of the fact that I'm going to be able to do these more than once a week, but, um, with my coaching clients, it's a little bit harder. Um, but maybe who knows, maybe I'll start doing it in the morning, my time, and you can at least catch the replay. And those that are in, you know, different parts of the world will be able to catch it live a little easier. So we'll see, we'll see how, how this all evolves. Any which way, um, I am, again, happy and so thankful that you are here. I look forward to all of your feedback. Leave me comments about what your thoughts are about these papers and about anything else that we've done. And uh, we will see each other next week. Until then, remember to resist the urge to hold back your emerging green brilliance. This is me, Tigre Gardenia. I'm out. Have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Bye.